The fetal circulation composes of a series of temporary structures. The ductus venosus, which means vein to vein, carries blood from the umbilical vein to the inferior vena cava, bypassing the liver. Some blood will go to the liver from the umbilical vein, however, most is shunted by the liver by the ductus venosus. Another temporary structure is known as the foramen ovale, and this is an opening between the atria of the heart, where the majority of blood is shunted from the right side of the heart to the left atrium. The ductus arteriosus, which means from artery to artery, is another temporary structure allowing blood to pass from the pulmonary artery into the descending branch of the aorta, bypassing the pulmonary circulation, because the foetus doesn't need its lungs at this present to breathe oxygen because it's in utero in fluid. The final temporary structures are the hypogastric arteries. These arise as branches of the internal iliac arteries. When they enter the umbilical cord, they're known as the umbilical arteries, and they return deoxygenated fetal blood to the placenta for oxygenation and replenishment with nutrients. What I want to do now is show you on a diagram the fetal circulation. Now, as you can see, the main picture includes the fetal heart, but there are other temporary structures I want to include so that you see the full picture. So first of all, I'm going to draw a placenta down here. And we've also got, further down the body, we've got the liver here, done in green, just to remind you that it is the liver. Okay. And if we look at the temporary structures we have, first of all, we talked about the ductus venosus. The ductus venosus, if we look at our diagram, this is the inferior vena cava here. The ductus venosus, here's our placenta. From the placenta, we have our umbilical cord that has in it two arteries and a vein. Now, as we've said, there will be a small blood supply going to the liver from the umbilical vein. That will perfuse the liver and that blood will slowly go back, make its way into the inferior vena cava. However, because the foetus doesn't need its liver so much in utero, because the placenta is doing most of the work of the liver, the liver is bypassed, and it's bypassed by this temporary structure known as the ductus venosus. And the ductus venosus goes from the umbilical vein, bypassing the liver, so that the majority of oxygenated blood picked up at the, at the placental bed travels along the ductus venosus into the inferior vena cava and this is highly oxygenated blood that is coming in here into the inferior vena cava. This into the highly oxygenated blood goes then up the inferior vena cava into the right atrium. Now there's another temporary structure that we talked about the foramen ovale, which is just Latin for oval window. And it's a, it's, if you like, there's a little flange. This, this septum isn't complete. There's a flange there with a gap. So what happens is the blood flow, because it's under high pressure, flows directly from the right atrium across through the foramen ovale into the left atrium. What happens then is blood flow flows from the left atrium into the left ventricle. This blood then, because it's highly oxygenated, and the whole point of this is to get highly oxygenated blood to the brain because of the fetus, the embryo in the fetus is maturing, the brain is growing and developing and controls all systems, so you want high oxygenation, highly oxygenated blood going to the brain. So blood is then pumped from the left ventricle along the aorta, backflow being prevented by a semilunar valve here, blood flows along the aorta, up the aortic, aortic systematic arch, and again, you will get highly oxygenated blood flowing along the carotid and coronary arteries, and also the upper body will be well perfused because blood here is flowing to the subclavian artery, which will feed the upper arms and, and upper body. This is why when you look at a newborn baby, you will see that the upper body tends to be much better built and much stronger than the lower body. It's because the upper body has received a higher perfusion of oxygen. So this blood then goes up to the head and neck 
obviously some will go down the descending aorta and will travel to the rest of the body and oxygenate the rest of the body. That blood that has gone up to the head and brain and neck perfuses the brain and then returns via the superior vena cava and I'm drawing it in green here to show that it's, it's lesser oxygenated comes down the super, superior vena cava into the right atrium and it meets the blood flow that is coming in from the inferior vena cava that's highly oxygenated and you will get a mixing about 25% of the blood here does mix however the streams of blood flow are at different angles so what happens is this lesser oxygenated blood will flow at the back of this flow going across the way and it will flow at the back of that stream going from the right atrium into the right ventricle. Blood then is pumped from the right ventricle along the pulmonary trunk with again backflow being prevented by a semilunar valve here and will go along the pulmonary trunk. Now normally what would happen is blood would then flow to the lungs. So some blood will flow to the lungs. However, remember, the lungs aren't working because the fetus is in actually a bag of water. So the baby won't, the fetus won't be breathing in oxygen. But you will get some blood flow to the lungs so that the lungs do have a blood supply and they can grow and develop. However, the majority of the blood is shunted along this temporary structure here, which doesn't exist in the adult heart, along here, which is the ductus arteriosus and blood is shunted from the pulmonary trunk through the ductus arteriosus into the descending aorta. So you've got your blood supply and your blood flow going through the heart. What happens then is this blood mixes with other blood that goes into the descending aorta. Eventually the lower limbs will be perfused and what, what will happen is you will you will get blood entering the iliac arteries and this blood that enters the iliac arteries will then go to another temporary structure the hypogastric arteries these then transport the blood back to the umbilical cord where the hypogastric arteries, once they enter the cord, are known as the umbilical arteries. They will return that lesser oxygenated blood. I mean, by this stage, the blood actually is quite less perfused because it's been all the way around the system. And it will go back to the placental bed. Carbon dioxide will be dropped off and it will diffuse across the placenta. Meantime, this is a continuing circulation. So as deoxygenated blood or lesser oxygenated blood is being transported along the umbilical arteries to the placental bed and carbon dioxide and waste products are going across back to mum, what will happen is that oxygen and nutrients again diffuse or are transported by various mechanisms across the placenta into that umbilical vein where the whole system will start all over again. So that's the fetal circulation and how it operates. However, what we find is once the baby has been born, there are various changes that occur at birth because the baby, once it's born, will need an adult circulation because it is now breathing air. So there are significant changes that occur at birth. These changes are triggered by lots of things. Initially, there is a physiological hypoxic state. So whilst the mother is having contractions, these contractions cause hypoxia. We know it's levels of carbon dioxide that stimulate the respiratory system to make us breathe, or the respiratory sensor in the medulla oblongata to make us breathe. So high levels of carbon dioxide caused by the contractions trigger the fetus to try and breathe. At the moment, it can't breathe because it's still in utero, but the trigger is there. Once the fetus is out as a baby, that trigger will cause the baby to breathe. What happens as well is that you get a production 
the production of lung fluid that has been occurring during pregnancy, this ceases. As the foetus is travelling down the vagina, there is thoracic squeeze. So any fluid that is in the lungs is squeezed out by the vagina. As soon as the baby's born, there's also external stimuli, bright lights, there's noise, there's a drop in temperature. And this, in addition to the response to the internal changes that are happening with the hypoxic state, also stimulate the baby to breathe. What you also find is that blood oxygen and the pH levels fall as the foetus is being born and carbon dioxide tension rises and these factors stimulate chemoreceptors and cause the baby to breathe, gasp and establish rhythmic, rhythmic respirations. So if we actually have a look at what happens then once the baby is born the lungs take over from the placenta as the organs of gaseous exchange. The ductus arteriosus the foramen ovale and the ductus venosus and the umbilical vessels are no longer needed. So let's have a look what happens. With the first breath, the lungs expand. The vascular resistance of their vessels fall and blood supply is much increased. So what you find is that with that first gasp, the blood that was going along the ductus arteriosus along here actually gets drawn into the lung. So the baby gasps and this blood that was going along the ductus arteries no longer goes along there and goes along the pulmonary arteries to the lungs. As a result of that, you get an increase in pressure of the blood coming back from the pulmonary veins into this left atrium. Meantime, because the cord has stopped pulsating either due to the natural physiological response that over a period of time the cord will stop pulsating or the midwife has clamped and cut the cord, the pressure in the inferior vena cava is reduced. So you have high pressure in the left atrium, reduced pressure now from what it was in the right atrium. That causes this mechanical flap the foramen ovale to shut and it flaps shut, closes shut and you've now got separate atria. They are no longer connected by the foramen ovale. So the oxygenated blood returning from the lungs via the pulmonary veins enters the left atrium and this higher pressure causes that flap, the foramen ovale, to be forced shut. This is now, the foramen ovale is now known as the fossa ovalis. The ductus arteriosus is no longer required because blood is going along the pulmonary arteries to the lungs and then oxygenated blood returning via the pulmonary veins. So this ductus arteriosus here is no longer required. So it constricts soon after birth and it becomes the ligamentum arteriosum. So it's, got mo it's changed its name from the ductus arteriosum to the ligamentum arteriosum. And it constricts as we said soon after birth and it closes gradually in infancy and is usually obliterated by about three months of age. The umbilical arteries constrict at birth to present, to, which are down here, they constrict at birth to prevent blood loss. The umbilical vein does remain patent for some time. The abdominal portion of the umbilical vein from the umbilicus to the liver becomes fibrosed and that becomes the ligamentum teres. The ductus venosus that was bypassing the liver along here that was shunting, that collapses because we don't need the ductus venosus now and that becomes the ligamentum venosum. So now what will happen is the liver will get an increased blood flow and the liver will now do its usual role and function. There's no placenta anymore to do the functions of the liver, so there will be an increased blood supply to the liver, and again, that will feed back into the inferior vena cava as it would in a normal adult circulation. The hypergastric arteries are no longer needed, and they become obliterated. That just means filled in, and they become known as the obliterated hypergastric arteries. So now we have a baby that is born due to changes in pH, carbon dioxide levels, thoracic squeeze, external and internal stimuli has been caused to gasp. The gasping has caused increased pressure in the 
left atrium that causes the foramen ovale to shut, the ductus arteriosus now becomes a ligamentum arteriosum because it's not required, the hypergastric arteries become obliterated, and now we've moved from having a fetal circulation to an adult circulation.